I wanted to tell you um, last night when we were doing that first, or the second presentation, yeah, um, that when we were talking about the fireballs coming from the sky, <laughs> there's a, a DVD over there called Plead by Fire, and you'll want to get that because it goes right along with this. He doesn't connect them with the trumpets, but he tells the vision and everything about the fireballs that Ellen White saw, the dreams, and he put it together very, very well. So I hope you all get it and look at it because they're right out, right back there. And um, it will, I think it will help a lot for your understanding of this too. Okay, we will have prayer. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, again we come to you to thank you for such a lovely day that you have given us and the things that we were that we learned and just having a good time together. We thank you for the feast there. It's just so wonderful because we know that you're here with us and that there's brings such joy to our hearts. And we just pray tonight as we do this um, next presentation on the next three woes of the trumpets that you will be with me. Please help me, Lord, to uh, speak clearly and slowly so people can hear and understand and grasp what is being said. And uh, we just pray that... Um, our ears will be open and our eyes as well. For you are trying to show us the things that are coming upon this earth. And you want us to be prepared. And we just pray that your sweet spirit will abide with his, with us here. And your holy angels minister to us tonight. And we thank you in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, we're now we're going to speak about the last three trumpets of Revelation. The three woes. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. And the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Joel also gives a very descriptive narrative about the same event. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared into battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as if were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the king of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his, hath his name Apollyon. So what is this very weird description of the fifth trumpet all about? Do we take it to be literal or symbolic? Is it a very literal? It is a very literal event indeed, but John is trying to describe something that is unseen to humans, 
something that can be only expressed in symbolic language. As we have already identified the star that has been falling, fallen to earth in both the third and the fifth trumpet is Satan on a mission of destruction. And I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. What and where is the bottomless pit? Let's first find the definition of bottomless pit. Bottomless means abuso, it means depthless, abyss, or deep, or a pit. And what is a pit? It's a hole in the ground dug for obtaining or holding water or other purposes figuratively an abyss as a prison. So we see that the word bottomless pit and abyss have the same meaning, a depthless hole in the ground used to contain or hold something or someone as in a prison. And in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, the abyss, and delivered or committed them into chains of darkness, gloom, to be reserved or detained unto judgment. In Revelation 21 through 3, we read that at the second coming of Christ, a mighty angel who has a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand takes a hold of Satan and casts him into the abyss, binding him in this bottomless pit for a thousand years. In the story given us in Luke 8, it also gives us a clue about what and where the bottomless pit or the abyss is. When Yeshua commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man who was possessed with a regiment of demons or devils, the demons begged him repeatedly not to order them to go to the abyss. This evidence, together with the fact that Satan will be cast into the abyss after the second coming of Christ, seems to indicate that the bottomless pit is a very unpleasant abode of Satan and his demons. The abyss represents some place of isolation away from heaven and men, apparently a place of misery. Many years ago, I heard that there had been sightings of UFOs disappearing into the, in, and, and to the earth at the North Pole. This could easily make sense as being the bottomless pit, a place of isolation away from heaven and men. Could I add that this is also the abode of Santa Claus? The center of the earth seems to be a perfect place for the bottomless pit. We must ever bear in mind that Jehovah is at all times in control of everything that happens here on earth, as well as over all his creation. This includes Satan and all the demonic hosts. When Satan is given the key of the bottomless pit, it means that Yah has lifted the restraint which had been placed on the devil and his evil host. Now he is given permission to allow his demons to come out of their prison house for a season to fulfill the purpose of Jehovah in the closing scenes of earth's history. In Revelation 9-2, And he opened the bottomless pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. What were they given power to do? And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. This also takes us back to the plagues in Egypt. In, in Exodus 10, it says, Tomorrow will I bring the locusts unto thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth. And they shall fill the houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy father's fathers have seen, since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. Comparing it with Joel's prophecy, they shall run to and fro in the city, and they shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the window like a thief. Notice these locusts were only to enter the houses of the Egyptians and their servants, not the dwellings of the Israelites. And they shall fill thy houses and the houses of all of thy servants and the houses of all the Egyptians. The same for the locusts in Revelation. They could only harm those without the seal of Yah. 
and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. In Luke 10, Jesus had sent 72 of his disciples out two by two on a missionary tour, and they returned with the thrilling report, Lord, they said, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus gave the disciples two reasons why the demons were subjected to them. First, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In other words, Satan is a fallen foe. Notice the similarity of this statement to what John described in the fifth trumpet. I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. When Jesus said that he had seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning, he was explaining why the disciples could cast out demons. Satan and his demons had no power over the disciples, but, and this is Je Jesus' second reason, the disciples had power over the demons. Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The serpent had been a demonic symbol since the beginning of time. In this verse, Jesus also made scorpions a demonic symbol. This is additional evidence that the locusts in the fifth trumpet, whose home is the abyss, are demons. We have in the Old Testament book of Joel a type of this fifth trumpet in Revelation. Notice the following similarities between Joel and Revelation. In Joel, a day of clouds and blackness, they have the appearance of horses. It has the teeth of a lion. With a noise like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops like a mighty army drawn up for battle. And in Revelation, the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke of the abyss. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. Their teeth were teeth like lion's teeth. The sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Notice the activity of these locusts or demons in Revelation 9, 4, and 6. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing and neither any tree. The destroyers are now are not allowed to harm the vegetation of earth because if they did that would the world would perish from famine before Christ arrived they were given permission to hurt only those men which had not the seal of god in their foreheads the demons are only allowed to harm those who don't have the seal of god if we do not want to be tormented by these demons then we must have the seal of yah so what is his seal that will protect us? Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And hallow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Why would Jesus allow the devil to harm his own people? The primary purpose of the seven trumpets is to awaken man to his need of salvation. Jesus will save all who turn to him in faith. The suffering inflicted by the devil will cause many to reconsider their need of a Savior, and many will be saved. Amen. Satan will not be allowed to afflict God's people during the fifth trumpet. But the torment that he and his evil hosts inflict on the wicked will be so terrible that they will long to die, but death will elude them. Job understood this kind of pain. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and life and to the bitter in soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures? That's a lot of pain. These evil spirits were commanded not to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And we're going to cover the five months in a later, later presentation. 
And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and they shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. For possibly, possibly more insight concerning this fifth trumpet and the release of these demons, we need to take a look at, a, at the mysterious seven-story high, massive, high-powered international observatory in southeastern Arizona. Located six miles south of Safford, it houses one of the largest telescopes on Earth, the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. The Vatican Observatory Research Group operates the 1.8M Alice P. Lemon, uh, Lennon Telescope with its Thomas B. Bannon Astrophysics Facility, known together as the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope at the Mount Graham International Observatory in southeastern Arizona. With the large light-gathering power of the LBT, astronomers are now able to collect the spectral fingerprint of the faintest and most distant objects in the universe. Near-infrared observations are essential for understanding the formation of stars and planets in our galaxies, as well as revealing the secrets of the most distant and young galaxies. Why, what did they name this telescope? Lucifer, which means, they say, large binocular telescope near infrared utility with camera and integral field unit for extragalactic research. The telescope is dubbed Lucifer 1 and provides a powerful tool to gain spectacular insight into the universe from the Milky Way to extremely distant galaxies. Who else is involved with the Vatican in this observatory? Lucifer is curiously described on the Vatican's observatory website as NASA and the Vatican's infrared telescope called Lucifer. Lucifer, the Vatican's mysterious astronomical, astronomical observatory in Arizona. Okay, how did the Vatican obtain this property? In 1984, the University of Arizona and the Vatican selected Mount Graham as a site for a complex of 18 telescopes. The fact that this is a sacred place for the Apache was not taken into consideration. To get around the legal barriers of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, the university hired a lobbying firm to put pressure on Congress to remove this and other roadblocks. Congress passed the Arizona-Idaho Conservation Act in 1988 in response to lobbying by the University of Arizona and the Vatican. The act included a provision to allow the construction of three telescopes on Mount Graham without having to comply with the American Indian Religious Freedoms Act or with environmental laws. For many Native American nations, there are certain geographic places which have special spiritual meaning. These sacred places are often portals to the spirit worlds. For the Apache in Arizona, one of these sacred places is Mount Graham. This place is called Big Seated Mountain. It is here that the Guyan, the guardian spirits of the Apache, lives. Why has the Vatican taken such an interest in outer space? What is it that the Vatican is looking for? What could eventually add mystery to the Vatican's astronomical observatories? would be the mysterious object they are apparently looking for, which would come from a very remote distance, according to the researchers at the YouTube channel Right Hemispheric Remote Reviewing. If it reached Earth, the cosmic object would cause three days of darkness, create an environment characterized by fire and sulfur, and would be a source of great fear for those who are aware of the search, according to the presenter, John Vivanco. According to Mitch Batros, 
some people believe it is for the purpose to monitor to monitor a warning presented in the Bible. What exactly is that warning they're looking for? Could it be it is named Wormwood, coming from the New Testament book of Revelation? Could this cosmic object in which they are intently watching for be that of the fallen star Wormwood or the fallen star Abaddon or Apollyon? Let's take a look for some clues in the type of these trumpets given during the plagues of Egypt, just before the Exodus. We have the type given in the ninth plague of Egypt, which would be equivalent to the fifth trumpet at the end of time. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They, the Egyptians, saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. The eighth plague in Egypt was that of locusts, which came just before the ninth plague which was the three days of darkness. I see that the fifth trumpet is a combination of both. When the bottomless pit is open, the locust or demon coming out of the pit is what caused the darkness of the sun and sky. When this pit is opened, all the legions of demons from hell are released and come out in such droves that the sun and sky are darkened. I believe this coming out could last for three days. As Revelation 12, 4 says that a third of the angels of heaven sided with Lucifer in his rebellion against Yah and were cast out with him to this earth. Daniel 7, 10 speaks of the myriads of angels who minister to Yah. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. A third of this number would be an overwhelming amount of evil spirits. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. On the website called Catholic Answers, a question was asked. What is the Catholic's position on the three days of darkness? The answer was given. The three days of darkness is a private revelation of several Catholic saints and mystics. It is said that to be three days where there will be no light and hell will be loosed upon the world. Is it possible the Vatican has the same information as the Mayan? Both speak of an event coming from the center of our galaxy Milky Way. Both indicate a powerful celestial event. But the most important question of all is when? Continuing with the Vatican Observatory. The Vatican's observatory is one of the oldest active astronomical observatories in the world, with its roots going back to 1582 and the reform of the Julian calendar. One of the important duties of the church is to maintain an accurate calendar, and this requires astronomical observations, hence the involvement of the Vatican with astronomy. The first Vatican Observatory was established in 1774. Papal interest in astronomy can be traced to Pope Gregory XIII, who had the Tower of the Winds built in the Vatican in 1578. The observatory, in its present form, was officially founded in 1891 by Pope Leo XIII. Interesting. Today there are 13 Jesuits from six countries throughout the world on staff. Of the observatory. The Superstition Mountains and the Lucifer Device. Who oversees this operation for the Vatican? That this institution is run by priests of the Society of Jesus, known as Jesuits, may not sound so strange because they are traditionally in charge of the most intriguing missions of the Catholic Church, and their direct access to the popes give them certain privileges. The author 
authors visited said observatory to learn more about the facility, the Lucifer device, and generally what the Vatican's interest is in outer space. They asked the Jesuit on duty that day, who told us that among the most important research occurring with the site's Vatican astronomers is the quest to pinpoint certain extrasolar planets and advanced alien intelligence. Indeed, the openness with which the Jesuit discussed the UFOs stunned us as we sat in the control room, listened to him speak so casually of the redundancy with which UFOs are captured on screens darting through the heavens. We were shocked at this, how ordinarily it seemed to be. Consul Mango shared with them a private article in PDF in which he admits how contemporary societies will soon look to the aliens to be the saviors of mankind. Observatory director Jose Funes has gone equally far suggesting that alien life not only exists in the universe and is our brother, but will, when manifested, confirm the true faith of Christianity and the dominion of Rome. As the authors dug deeper, questioned more, and followed up, they were told how some Vatican theolo theologian, theologians accept the possibility that an extraterrestrial species may exist that is morally superior to man, closer to God, than we fallen humans are, and that, consequently, they may come here to evangelize us. Yusupi states that this would not immediately oblige the Christian to renounce his own faith in God simply on the basis of the reception of new, unexpected information of a religious character from the extraterrestrial civilization, but that such a renunciation would come soon after, as the new religious content originating from outside the earth is confirmed as reasonable and credible, and may require conducting a re-reading of the gospel, inclusive to the new data. And according to the former Vatican Observatory Vice Director, Christopher Corbley, while Christ is the first and the last word, the Alpha and the Omega, spoken to humanity, he is not necessarily the only word spoken to the universe, which brings us to the reason for the Lucifer device. Lucifer is an infrared telescope. Why would someone want that? Some UFOs cannot be seen with the naked eye, only infrared. We only ever see camera phones, videos on TV and YouTubes. They are shaky, unfocused, and rarely definite, de definite. However, some of the most astonishing UFOs ever caught on film have been recorded with infrared. So the Vatican is interested in UFOs and aliens. It is prepared to accept a different enlightened gospel from what they had been entrusted with. Okay, so the Vatican is interested in UFOs and aliens. It is prepared to accept a different enlightened gospel from that which they had been entrusted with. Further, they are willing to compel the faithful to renounce their faith in favor of an alien story its enlightened version of God and the Bible. The Pope is recognizing change, and he's recognizing science. There need to be a religion and Catholicism to make religion and Catholicism relevant. This is about the growing secularization of society. It's about survival. The Vatican and Catholic Church are neck high in idolatry and apostasy. So is it any wonder that they are looking for aliens? And in Luke 21, 11, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. After the overwhelming shock of the first four trumpets, the whole world will stand in horror at the terrible devastation that has come on the earth. 
human beings recognizing that their survival as a race is threatened. They will be grasping for solutions for some way, any way out of the desperate situation they are in. Furthermore, I expect that Earth's inhabitants will immediately recognize the calamity that devastates their planet to be an act of God, and they will turn to their religious leaders for a spiritual solution. But what solution can the religious leaders offer? Enter Satan, E.T. He and his angels will claim to be from another part of our galaxy, or perhaps from a distant galaxy in the universe, claiming to be an advanced race that has overcome similar problems. They will offer their help, their help to be spiritual as well as physical, and of course the whole world will be searching for spiritual answers. These last four verses of the fifth trumpet is John doing his best to give the description of these evil spirits on their mission to torment mankind. How does one describe a demon spirit? And the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared into battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the king, the angel of the bottomless pit. Satan sees that his time is short. He has set all his agencies at work that man may be deceived, deluded, occupied, and in trance until the day of probation shall be ended and the door of mercy forever shut. Woe, one woe is past, and behold, there come two more, two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great rivers Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the horsemen, the army of the horsemen, were two hundred thousand thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jasoneth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the head of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and gold and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. The sixth trumpet is closely related to the fifth. It is also more terrible than any of the previous trumpets. It can take place only after the five-month period of the fifth trumpet is over. At the time of the, the demons were first released from the abyss, they were still somewhat restrained. God told Satan that he could torment Job by destroying his property, afflicting his body, but he put on a restraint. Job, I mean, Satan could not kill Job. The demons in the fifth trumpet can only uh, tor torment earth's inhabitants. They are held back from killing them, and they can only torment the wicked. They are specifically commanded not to torment God's people. But in the sixth trumpet, all restraint is moved, removed, 
and they are permitted to kill a third of mankind. For a clear understanding of these two different trumpet events and to identify the players involved, we need to compare the description, location, and action of each group. In the fifth trumpet, a star falls from heaven and to the earth and opens at the bottomless pit. Satan is given permission to release the demons from the pit, a place of isolation away from heaven and men. The sixth angel was given the commission to loose or release the four angels who were bound, confined, or restrained in the great river Euphrates. That's a literal place in the Middle East. The fifth trumpet, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The amount of demons coming out of this pit were so excessive, so enormous, as to darken the sun, and they could not be numbered. But in the sixth trumpet, the angel gave to John the number of the army, 200,000, 200 million horsemen army. This earthly army is incredibly massive, 200 million. This can only be a global army. In the fifth trumpet, John's description of the demons or locusts are described somewhat in military terms. But in the sixth trumpet, it portrays an enormous army prepared for a great war. In the fifth trumpet, and the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared into battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns of gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. This is the only way John could describe it as were as and thus I in the sixth trumpet it says and thus I saw the horses in the vision and then that sat on them and the fifth trumpet and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of, of many horses running to battle but in the sixth trumpet it says having breastplates of fire and of jasoneth and brimstone in the fifth and they had hair as hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lion. In the sixth, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lion, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. In the fifth, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. In the sixth trumpet, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were likened to serpents, and with them they do hurt. In the fifth trumpet, the demons were restricted for a limited time, five months, to only torment but not kill any man. But in the sixth trumpet, when the precise moment in time comes, the hour, the day, the month, and the year, this restriction is lifted by the highest authority in heaven. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife that they may not blow until the world shall be warm of his coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth, and when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there shall be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. Loose the four angels which are bound in the great rivers Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to go forth to slay the third part of men. But these three was the third part, by these three were the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which issued out of their mouth. The nations of the world are eager for conflict, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish but they are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. Every form of evil is to spring into intense activity. Evil angels unite their powers with evil men, and as they have been in constant conflict and attain an experience in the best mode of deception and battle and have been strengthening for centuries, they will not yield the last great final contest without a desperate struggle. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, 
that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. And thou shalt come from um, thy place out of the north part, thou and many people with thee, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me. And in Joel, it says, For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and the twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. And, thou, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. What event takes place when the seventh trumpet sounds? But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. What is this mystery of God? Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. In other words, probation is closed. There's nobody more there's to left to accept. The gospel, our job is over. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. These texts tell us that the proclamation of the gospel has a uh, termination point, the end of the age, just before the second coming of Christ. Logic requires us to understand that the gospel will be preached only during the probationary time. Once probation closes, there will be no more need for the gospel because every human being will have made his or her final choice. The close of probation. The work of man's redemption will soon be ended. The last prayer for sinners will have been offered. The last tears shed. The last warning given. Our probation is soon to close. Soon will the voice from the throne declare, It is done. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every, to give every man according as his work shall be. The wrath of God. The seven last plagues. The world is soon to be left by the angel of mercy, and the seven last plagues are to be poured out. The bolts of God's wrath are soon to fall. And when he shall begin to punish the transgressors, there will be no period of respite until the end. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. 
And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girdled with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth for ever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And I heard the vo great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went out and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of water, and they become blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues in for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and in true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. What are the plans of the Vatican and all the earthly kings and their armies when they, through their Lucifer infrared telescope, see Yeshua and his heavenly army with myriads of angels coming in the clouds of heaven? They point their guns at Yeshua. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of earth must come, must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him 
that sat on the horse and against his army. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, which were around sixty to a hundred pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. The false prophet and the beast is not a person. It's a religious political system. That's what is thrown into the fire is Satan's, Lucifer's, one world order. Praise the Lord. It's over. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were killed with their flesh. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So this is the end of this presentation. We have, we've gone through all the seven trumpets and the seven plagues. And tomorrow night we will just continue on with this and where we're at now and taking us to the plagues. I mean, to the trumpets is um, our next set of um, presentations. Is there any questions? I don't want to take too many because I, oh, <laughs> she needs one of, um, you going to give your testimony, Kelly? Okay. But if there is any. I would say so, yes. So the trumpets come first, except for that last trumpet when he blows it. Probation is closed, the seventh trumpet, but then they go right into the plague. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, the question was, uh, where do where does the close of probation fall um, before between the trumpets and the plagues? And my answer is yes. That's how I see it. Okay, um, I hope I can repeat this. Um, today, it has been said that the, the Congress is had hearings concerning UFOs. Anything in particular? Just UFOs? Yes, it does definitely. Yeah, it does. Well, they, these UFOs are going to get more and more bold. I mean, they're going to be seen more, I, I believe. Okay, we'll have closing prayer, and then you can have your testimony. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just want to thank you for watching over us and uh, keeping us safe in your little sanctuary here. And we just pray that um, as we go our separate ways this evening, that you will be with every dear soul here, keeping each one of us safe and watching over us throughout the night hours and giving us rest so that we can have a refreshing day tomorrow again with you. And we praise you and thank you in Yeshua's name.